first, I really want to thank you for uh, joining on in on this uh, crazy little uh, project uh, to have you uh, here uh, guiding us along the way in echolocation. But uh, Thomas, if you could uh, just uh, really shortly introduce yourself and, and what you can. Yes, so um, my name is Thomas. I, I come from Norway and I live in Oslo. I uh, am educated as a classical singer and I have my master's in music therapy. So I also work as a music therapist and I'm here because I was born blind with something called LCA. Um, which we don't need to go into, but it basically means that I don't see anything. And approximately seven years ago in 2014, I met this guy <clears throat> called Daniel Kish. Now Daniel is um, located in California and he, he, he wasn't born blind, but he had cancer in his eyes. So he was, he's been blind from like 12 months into his life or something like that. And he um, is, maybe the most famous echolocator uh, that we know of in in the world in the at least in, in uh, as far as in in the human kind so daniel has been um teaching blind people how to echolocate and he's done two masters one in psychology and one in special education and basically he's been like blind people have been echolocating for for years and years and years and so I even heard some researchers argue that people back in the Stone Age was using echolocation before they could use fire to light, um, to have lights in, in the night. But uh, we don't know about that. But, <clears throat> but Daniel has been sort of making, uh, creating a method how to teach echolocation and so forth. So I've been, um, right now I'm in his, um, in, it, I'm, I'm to be an instructor um, of echolocation, so I'm training under him, under his supervisation, and um, and that's why I'm here. So I'm essentially um, using echolocation all the time, and that's yeah. why <laughs> that's why I was asked to come here. Yeah, it's super great that you're here. But um, first, uh, I we would like to know what do you use uh, echo like echolocation for? So how do you use uh, echolocation? Yeah, so um, I've been using my my hearing all my life. Hearing has been the like the main sense that I take in information through. Um, what I've learned through the years is from from Daniel. So one could argue that everyone echolocates. You know, every every everyone that hears will use use echolocation to some degree. You know, if you guys go into walk into a church, you will hear that it's a big room. You don't need to see to check if it's a big room. You will hear that. But um, so and that's that could be called as sort of passive echolocation. You don't send out the signal. What I do as well is. Is make this sonar. Daniel actually calls it flash sonar because it's sort of like a it creates sort of like a flash like you when you take a picture, it sort of lights up the environment. And this is sort of the same. Um, so I would say that I use echolocation or flash sonar all, all the time. It's um, uh, both indoors and outdoors. Um, everything from detecting parked cars, poles, trees, um, people, houses. Um, you can hear I don't know the exact, I don't remember the exact number right now, but I can hear buildings from hundreds and meters away. It depends on what kind of signal I use with a tongue click, which is this. I, it only, it, it doesn't go super far. So sometimes I would need to use a hand clap to create a, 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 a louder sound for it to reach farther. But essentially I use it for detecting things that I cannot reach with my hand or my cane. I use a I use a white cane as well. They don't um, serve the same purpose, so to speak. So they're I, I wouldn't choose <laughs> one or another if they're if they're serving different purposes. But so yeah, I, I use echolocation both for I would say detecting things and discriminating between things. So I use them both to find things, like find a house or find somewhere I need to go, or avoid things, like avoid poles and trees and 
say stuff that I don't want to run into. Yeah, and can you, for example, can you um, can you put uh, obstacles in front of each other and saying, okay, for example, if we have something in front uh, a screen in front of a window, and then so there's two obstacles in ahead of you. Yes, you can do that. The so. the bigger the bigger the things are the easier they are to hear. And the further away from each other, the easier they are to hear. So if, for instance, if we were outside, um, like we were supposed to be, um, yeah. but we're not, <laughs> then if I were to clap my hands, and let's say that there is a, there is um, there are some trees 50 meters in front, and there's a house 50 meters behind the trees, then we would actually hear the difference. We would hear two different echoes uh, at two different time intervals. So we would first hear the trees go whoosh, and then we would hear the, the house go ka. So they're making different echoes and at different intervals. The same is the case. So you can also distinguish between materials, for example, so now oh, yeah, yeah, a tree yeah. and the house. So that's different sounds. Yes, it is. And that depends on the surface of the things. The harder the thing is, the more one way of one way of putting this is what I do when I echolocate is I make the things in the environment talk back to me and everything has a different voice. A tree sounds more uh, plushed than a building. Um, a tree with leaves sound even more plushy than a tree without leaves. So everything has their own has its own voice, so to speak. But going back to the thing you said about the screen in front of the window, it's possible to detect it. Uh, but it depends a bit on the material of the screen. So let's say that the screen was, if you have a screen of uh, aluminium in front of a window, then I probably wouldn't hear the window because the sound wouldn't go through the aluminium. But if it was, a, if you had a, a, a net, for instance, or a fence, you know, one of these fence that they have alongside the road with small holes in them, you have that and the window, then you could probably detect both if your if your hearing is keen enough. I mean, now we're talking about fine details, and I would need I would really need to beam in on it. But yeah, yeah it, it's I would say it's possible. Okay, that's really. And do you see? Is it uh, is it uh, sharp lines uh, or is it more like a blurry uh, um, obstacle? So saying, okay, well, there's something here, or is it like really it's there? And so it's really sharp where it is. Or is it <laughs> that, okay? There's something in that direction. There's something in the other direction. How how is your your um, your picture, if I may use that word? Yeah, you can use that word. You can actually use that word because they've discovered uh, in different studies uh, at Durham University, I think it is, that when people that are uh, trained to echolocate, when people that have been using this for some time use it. When they scan their brain, it's a everything comes through the ears, right? So they come through through hearing, but but in the brain, uh, the signals are processed in the visual cortex. So what actually shows up when I echolocate is actual pictures. There are not colors in there. No. It's not like the same thing, but but there are in the brain that the brain um, believes it to be or it it it. Uh, I'm losing my words. Great, an acoustic picture, if we can. Yes, we 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 can say that. Um, yeah. So um, I would say it it's gotten for me. It's been sort of like the pictures get clearer uh, from month to month. The more I use this, the more refined my my skills become. Some things sound more blurry than other things, but that doesn't necessarily makes it harder. To, to detect them, it's okay. just, it's just when when someone is learning to echolocate, then then you, you just you start to learn to discriminate between the different sounds. So a blurry sound doesn't make the picture blurry, for instance. Okay. Okay. But I, just to put in as well, probably the animals that use this, they're, <laughs> they they know how to do this. I mean, many blind people are not being taught how to echolocate before they're adults and that's that's a shame that's like that's like asking when do you want your kid to start to look 
with his or her eyes. You don't ask that kind of question. But somehow it's 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 not the same thing with, with blind people. Many of us are not taught before we're adults because the world in general doesn't really know so much about teaching echolocation to blind people. So the animals, the kind of picture they're getting, I would guess it's not, it, it's much more uh, refined than the ones I get. I, I'm just guessing because they've done yes. it all their life and it's sort of a thing from nature that they just do. Yeah. And does your, I mean, does your resolution, uh, just coming back to your picture, is does your re resolution, does that change when you, for example, when you move? Yes, it changes all the time. I I don't, um, I don't think I click as often as some of the whales will do, but it changes uh, when I'm when I'm walking. So every time there's a new click, every time there is a small change in in the picture. Um, and actually, so the, when you when you walk, uh, let's say just walking on the street in Oslo, do you click like uh, how? What's your click rate? Uh, it, it depends on it depends on where I am. It, but if I'm a, if I'm at a street in Oslo, I would probably be going like that approximately yeah. because okay. there suddenly there's going to be poles there and yeah. uh, or things. But uh, what you what you would also see um, is that I would I would move my head okay. to yeah. be scanning because if I click in this direction, I might miss something which is over here. So I will, I will need to, I'm both clicking and I'm scanning wow. um, at, at the same time, which I don't know how the, how the whales actually do that, but I'm they guessing the they... Same. You see a lot of the head turn also. Yeah. Um, and, um, but actually, it, but actually, but actually, just to put in, also when when we are, if I'm if I'm bicycling, for instance, then <laughs> then I'm going bicycle and echolocate. Yeah, if you there are no videos uh, with me doing that, but if you Google Daniel Kish bicycling or, or you just Google echolocation bicycle, then you will find there is another guy, another instructor um, whom I know who's called Juan Ruiz. He lives in in Austria, and he set the world a world record in bicycling uh, between these sort of poles that he's going left and right and left and right between. And then he's just clicking like mad, and is <laughs> which is amazing. Which, <laughs> so yeah. the faster the faster you're going, the faster you want to click. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, and and what's important when you do this echolocation? Uh, should there be silence? Uh, or are you able to hear if there are sounds or I guess you need to be kind of focused on getting the echo back. Yeah, it's uh, uh, <laughs> ideally there would be no other sound, <laughs> Yeah, okay. but there are, but there are all the time and it's not, it's not that a huge um, challenge. It, it depends on the background noise, but usually um, I can hear what I need to hear through through sound. What really can muffle things up are like construction work. If they are, you know, having big machines or ham constant hammering, that's that can be a, that can be tricky. And then then this scanning thing becomes really important yeah. because then you need to get you, you just need to position your head so that you can miss the sound from the environment, but you can still hear your own sound and the environment talking back. But it's, um, yeah, noise can noise can be challenging. OK. And um, what about weather, for example, if it's uh, raining or lots of wind? Is that just going as a background sound also? So it reduces? It, but, uh... It's sort of the same. The main challenge with weather is, is the wind. Because okay. if you and and you will know that from you know if you're walking outside if you have if you walk right towards the wind then then at a certain uh, angle you get the wind in both your ears and you don't hear hear anything but if you change your if you move your head slightly away if the wind will suddenly stop in a way okay. so it's so then it's it's also about scanning yes, and scanning yes. and scanning yeah. 
and I mean, what uh, what else interfere with you? I mean, for example, if you are super hungry, or if there's a odd smell, or it, can can that interfere with your? It 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 can. That would that would probably be the same as if you, uh, if you are hungry, or if you yes. you, know, you get lazy in traffic or lazy when you're seeing. It's it's probably the same thing. There, there I wouldn't say that there are any specific other senses that sort of dominates um, more than others uh, and interferes. But yeah, it's it, it's it's just the same thing. And sometimes, if I'm tired or it's been a long day, or I'm uh, or I'm pissed off or angry or some sort of emotional unstable, <laughs> lack of yeah. a better word, then I then I recognize that I'm walking outside and I'm not echolocating. I'm just uh, just angry yeah. at the world and just walking. Then I don't do it. And then suddenly I remember, oh, I need to pay attention here. And <laughs> so it's uh, okay. but I, I guess that that's pretty much the same. If you're using your eyes or your ears, it's, <laughs> it's the yeah. same. <laughs> yes, 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 very much. Um, and you said that you were able to do more things at the same time. So, for example, if I came walking with you in in Oslo and and you were echolocating, could you talk to me at the same time? Yeah, I could. That okay. that wouldn't be that that wouldn't be a challenge. It, it, I mean, uh, of course, the more things I'm doing, the more the easier it is to to be distracted. And it depend really depended on the environment. So if we were navigating a super hard environment, then I probably wouldn't talk that much. But but also when I'm when I'm walking with other blind people that echolocate, we also talk along the way. So it's not it's not like we need to stop talking. So you're using two languages at the same time. Yeah, that could be said. Yes. <laughs> and you echolocate echolocate to each other? No, right? You use your we, we actually sometimes use it um, not as a language, but we sometimes use it to find each other. So if we're in a you know, like if we're in a big crowd, then you know if, if no one sees the other and there are so many people around, then we can sometimes make a, a very loud click and there's no one else <laughs> that, yeah, that knows far. how to do it. And yeah, exactly. So, but it's a, it's not like a language <laughs> in no. those terms. <laughs> no, no, it's just a awareness. But actually, um, just a fun fact is that it's. You know the the click that we make with our tongue that actually comes from, or it doesn't come from that, but there has been, um, I don't know if I know the word in English, phonicists, pheno people that work works with um, phonetic, um, yeah. like sounds that you make that you use in language, and some some languages are using various tongue clicks. You will have that, for instance, in some African languages. Um, so the tongue click that we use actually it doesn't come from a language, but but in some languages they will use on suddenly there they will have a tongue click in there, and that's the same sound as we use. So it's kind of funny in some in wow. some languages it might even be a word, or yes. or a syllable or or a letter. <laughs> yes, yeah, amazing to hear how it is all evolved. Um, have, now uh, I'm coming into more what we work with. So, mm -hmm. um, of course, we work with the uh, gillnets, as we have uh, just uh, briefly um, explained to you. And um, have have you, for example, have you ever touched a fishing net? Yes, I have. You have touched a fish. So you know these really thin lines. And yeah. um, do you think if we, for example, put a net up in a doorway, an open doorway, would you be able to hear that there's a barrier in, ahead? It's hard to say. I would have to try it, but my guess is yes, it, it would be would be detectable as long as it's because okay, the all the all the threads in there are are tiny, tiny, but there are a lot of them, so it's not the same as thin air. So I my guess is yes, but if uh, if I were let's say I was jogging or I was um, yeah, it it would depend on my speed and it would depend on if I we're looking for something very um, invisible or not yeah. <laughs> because this, yes. because because this would be almost the entire opposite from from a hard wall for instance yeah so you would need to let's say uh, have your focus on detecting there's a thin barrier for example like if now you have a curtain in your background so if there's a curtain uh, could you detect a curtain yes yes okay. definitely Okay. And actually, because that's because the curtain is is a very 
it's a very soft woolly material. It's kind of like if you walk into um, I was I was walking into one of these. Uh, it was a it was a recording studio, and in those kind of rooms, they do all they can to make sort of a dead sound. You don't want any echoes in there. And when you walk in there, it's sort of like someone just suddenly, oops, put something over your ears, and everything just goes dead. And it's sort of the same with 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 curtains that I I don't the the, the curtain doesn't really make an echo. It sort of kills the sound, and that's how you know it's there, because it it what it sends it's some some materials like stone or tree hard surfaces they send the signal back, so you get an actual echo. A, a curtain would more it's more like it swallows the sound that I'm sending out. Yes, yes. Um, I've and never that's, thought about it that way, but yeah. Well, I, I haven't good. actually either, but it's uh, so, so I, I don't think much about these things. It's just something that I do and yeah. and, it, and it's, it, it's based but on How do you normally react to a thin barrier? So for the example, things, like curtain or leaves on trees or uh, really thin, thin things that, are, uh, that you could um, that you can walk through. Would you stop or would you just, OK, this is something I'll just pass? Well, that, that depends on a lot of things. It would it would depend on like where I was walking, if I was walking in a forest or if I was walking on a road. Um, but my my actually my first reaction when I hear something which I'm not sure what is, then <clears throat> I will first try and figure out what it is or define it with echolocation. And then if I can, I will walk over and touch it. That's uh, that's because the the brain uh, needs to learn in different ways. It needs to get as much information about the thing that it can. So if I actually, if it, if the brain both gets the auditory information and the physical kinesthetic information, then it, then you know, it, I have more in my in my bank, so to speak. So next yes. time I don't need to touch it. But um, so there's a learning process along the way. Yes, when yes, I touch something there is. like, or when I hear this, then it's easy. The problem with gill nets and, and bycatch is that we cannot really allow a learning process because once they are in, they cannot get out, right? Exactly. So they don't have the chance of learning as you're describing here. And, um, that, might, and that might be part of the problem because I, I've been thinking about these um, these, <laughs> these guys a lot lately, lately since we were going to talk about this. And, <clears throat> and I think for me, um, one thing which is important to keep in mind is that when when I hear things, I don't know what kind of object I'm hearing. OK, so if I'm walking outside and I hear a big, hard sound to my right and I'm walking on the street, it most likely is a house. Mm. But that's that's my uh, interpretation of it. I don't hear it's a house. I hear the characteristics of the house. I don't hear that it's a house. I hear the I hear the echo from the house and the characteristics of the house. And then at some point I go, oh, it's probably a house because it's big, it's made out of stone, and it lays beside the road. It needs to be a house. Mm -hmm. But that's that's sort of my interpretation of it. And um, so if I'm imagining that I'm swimming with the fishes and with the whales, I wouldn't, uh, although I hear it's a net, I hear that it's something thin, I hear that there is water going through it. Uh, so I might be able to detect all the specifications of the thing, but I might not conclude that I, I will get entangled in it. So that might be part of the problem that, okay, so like you said earlier, they, they hear it, they hear that something is there, but that doesn't necessarily make it easy for them to understand that, that that's something they should avoid. What would make you stop? Uh, I would stop if there were some sort of. I was about to say some warning lights, but that wouldn't make any, <laughs> any difference, but some sort of auditory thing that scared me away or that that inclined that some in some way that this is dangerous. This is you, you need to avoid this. Um, yeah it probably wouldn't make sense to like it like in one way if it was possible to make like um some sort of sound that was only uh a that the whales were only able to hear not any other animals or you could 
I, I don't know. It, it, it would be hard because I, I guess me and the, the fishes and me, we, we both would sort of either not care or we would just go and investigate. And in both cases, we're stuck in the net. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, that's, um, it's not an easy task to, um, to find a solution, uh, that's for sure. Um, but it's super interesting to hear your views. Um, and um, we have thought about many ideas, and of course, one of them is is to increase attention to the net, or I mean, the pingers or the acoustic alarms that we can implement on nets do to tear the animals away, so that's functioning. Um, but if we are going away from the idea about using pingers, because they also kind of habituate to or they can habituate to sound on the way, and we don't want sound pollutions. We don't want batteries. It's uh, if we somehow could um, um, have a barrier that they kind of know this is not something I can swim through, mm -hmm. because we can we can um, increase uh, how do I say the the intensity of the net by maybe adding materials or making it more visible so it has a higher reflection. One thing um, for me since I learned to echolocate not as a uh, you know not as a skill that I started just naturally that, um, working with it was more something I was taught I, I in the beginning I, I learned it because I didn't run I didn't want to run into things and so for me, um, that's sort of what I used it for in the beginning. Um, so if I heard something in front, I would naturally slow down because I, I would know that there is something there. I don't know how the situation is in the oceans, but I'm guessing that there's not so much stuff that you can run into. I mean, if you hear, it's not like it's not like the fishes are walking or swimming on a road, and then they need to avoid a wall in front. If there's something in front, they can just either swim higher in the water or swim lower. It, it the the level of, or not not the level of, but their their uh, their escape routes are much bigger than what I have because I'm just walking on ground. Either I walk into stuff or I can walk around. But there are just two ways to avoid, or one way to avoid stuff. So if if it was possible to sort of find out, are there other things that the whales or the echolocative beings in the water, are there other things that they avoid? And then if you could make the nets sound similar to those things, that, that might be a way to go. But I don't know if there are such things that they actually avoid because there are not big walls or big, huge stuff in, <laughs> in the oceans that they avoid, as far as I know. Um, I mean, I think that, of course, that has very much to do uh, with the area. So, um, porpoises in the North Sea don't have the same picture as the porpoises in the Inner Danish waters, for example, mm. uh, where there's, how to say, much, uh, how to say, lower depth. So, they have, uh, how to say, less escape routes, where on really large depth, then they can have more space. Um, and there's also, of course, changes in seaweed and stones and gravels or the so the seabed material, of course, is also changing depending on which area you are in. Mm -hmm. um, but we can see that porpoises likes to be, be where the fish is and, and that's they like to be around, let's say, for example, small uh, reefs or stones where they can hide and, and all things. So. So they are in areas where there's uh, other materials around, mm -hmm. but uh, so they, they must be able to navigate around, for example, large stones or a seaweed, but we don't really know how they, for example, swim through a big uh, wall of seaweed. Do they swim through that or do they swim around it? We don't know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. But this was more or less the, the questions that I had for you. And I think it's been super, super interesting to hear uh, all your different views and ideas and, and, and seeing your acoustic picture uh, is amazing. 
I would love to be able to echolocate. Maybe I'll have to start a course with you. So I know. <laughs> it's not uh, hard. It's not, it's really not hard. This is not, this is not rocket science. If, if anyone would want to learn this, the only thing you need to need to do is go outside, close your eyes and clap your hands and you will hear the buildings around you talking to you. And yeah. that's just, that's where you begin. It's, it's not rocket science. Cool. But, uh, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'll cut the video off now and uh, we can just... <laughs>